So just to kind of situate where we are, all right, we're in the middle of this section five to eight, where Paul is unpacking the new humanity in Christ. Okay, it's uh, he he laid the foundation in the first four chapters with God's righteousness is comes through faith in Jesus Christ, and then he's unpacking the new humanity that's created in Christ. And we're going to get into some really uh, we're going to get into chapter 8, which I actually referenced this past Sunday in the gospel as peak Paul. Like Chapter 8 is one of the most beautiful chapters, and I would say all of Paul and even in all of Scripture. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that. It's really Paul at his best. So, uh, But we didn't quite finish chapter 6. I'm, I'm going to kind of blaze through chapter 6 just so that we can make sure we get to 7 and 8. But we did end at verse 15, okay? We'll, we'll go through this, but I won't spend a whole lot of time at the end of six. He's using an analogy here of uh, slavery, okay? Slavery to sin versus slavery to God. And the paradox, which I've already told you, right, is the paradox is that slavery to God is actually true freedom, right? But his audience would have been familiar with the institution of slavery. It was a part of Greco-Roman society. That was, it was just baked into the cake. It was how it was. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we'll pick up there, verse uh, chapter six, verse fifteen. Okay. What then are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? This is a restating of that question in six one. Like, hey, if sin brings grace, then let's just sin, and then grace will come, right? Okay. By no means. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. The main point here is <laughs> you can only serve one master. Okay, if you're a slave to sin, then you're not a slave to God. But if you've become slaves of righteousness, which again, the paradox is, there's your true freedom, then, then you belong to God. You can only belong to one master. Okay. Verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Paul's maybe adding this in here just in case somebody's scandalized that he's comparing life and God to slavery. Okay. Um, but he's using a human analogy is his point. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now yield your members to righteousness for sanctification. Remember back oh, a few chapters ago when he was going through all those psalms and it named all the body parts, right? They're given over to impurity. He's, he's playing off of, off of that, okay? That we've already kind of, that theme we've already kind of explored. Verse 20, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But then what return did you get? from the things of which you are now ashamed. The end of those things is death. I think that this is a really healthy thing for us to realize as sinners, that we eventually realize, right? That like, what did my sin really gain for me? <laughs> Nothing, right? And now I'm ashamed of it, and it really wasn't as rough. Sin, there's always an element of sin that is attractive. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it, okay? The, the, the devil has to put the poison apple in a candy coated caramel, you know, layer. Okay. Why? Because otherwise you wouldn't do it. If sin was just pure evil, you wouldn't do it. There's something attractive in it. What Aquinas, in Aquinas' terminology, he would call the apparent good. Okay. There's always something apparently good, but is it actually good for you? That's the question. So, you know, one way to think of sin is it's a, it's a, it seems often sin is a gain in the short term but it never is a gain in the long term. Sin is always unreasonable, which for St. Thomas is like one of his kind of definitions of sin. Sin is unreasonable. Because even if it gets me going in the short term, in the long term, it undermines my soul, my character, my relationship with God, my relationship with others, etc. Okay. Verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the return you get is sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a famous verse. And what a great verse, right, to sum it up. The wages of sin is death. 
if you are a sinner and you keep going on sinning and persisting in sin, you will eventually go bankrupt, okay? It's like withdrawing on a checking account. You can't just keep withdrawing forever, okay? Well, unless you're the U.S. Congress and then you try. Okay? No, but we, we, that's the problem, right, with the national debt is we can't, you can't do it forever, okay? Um, that's a whole different discussion. But like, but, like, it's not, like, you can't keep sinning and expect to get good results, okay? The wages of sin is death. Maybe not your physical death immediately, but certainly your spiritual death. Okay, so and then, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's why Aquinas would say sin is unreasonable because it's always on some level against your ultimate goal, which is blessedness, beatitude, life with God. Okay. All right. So that's a little. That's the end of chapter six. Okay. Um, now he's going to switch in chapter. Th this whole section is still connected though okay so he's not it's not a radical break from what we've been doing in five and six now he's going to use uh an analogy with marriage okay verse uh chapter seven all right and 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 i will i should say that um seven is a continuation of of the problem that he's kind of unpacking in in six okay as far as this this our you know being beholden to sin versus the spirit is what he's eventually going to get into Chapter 7, he's going to develop this problem more. And then chapter 8 is the solution. That's where chapter 8 is like looking at kind of from the mountaintop of the letter of the Rome. It's kind of, it's in the middle of the letter, but it's kind of the peak of the letter in some ways. Okay, And it, it is arguably chapter 8 is the climax of the letter. Not that the rest isn't important, but 8 you get the, like the mountaintop view. Okay, So the problem he's setting up in 7, he's going to deal with in 8. So uh, Paul's been using slavery to, uh, to sin versus slavery to God as an analogy for Christian freedom. Now he'll use a different analogy, marriage. Not that marriage is slavery. I'm not, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm celibate, so I don't know. You know, I, uh, all right. Uh, first, chapter 7, verse 1. Do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, the Jews, okay, that the law is binding on a person only during his life. Thus, a married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. What's his point there is marriage is until death do us part. Okay, you're not under the law if you're not you're not married anymore if one of the, or both of the spouses have died. One of my one of my little pet peeves. Although when you're actually celebrating a wedding, you have to bite your tongue on this, but. When people have signs that say, like, the beginning of forever or together forever, it's like, actually, what you're saying is till death do us part, or hey, you should know what you're promising before you get married, okay? <laughs> like, this is not an eternally binding thing. This is a, till the, you know, anyway, but I don't say anything. But. Um, yeah, well, you know. I, it's, yeah, it's, it's not correct. I mean, it's, it's till death do you part. That's what it says, okay? Uh, and anyway, that's what you're promising, right? Um, so, uh, accordingly, verse three, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, like the marriage covenant contract. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. If her husband's died, she can get remarried. Okay. Uh, by the way, Paul here is echoing Jesus's teaching on marriage. We don't. We won't get all into that. But Matthew nineteen. Jesus really doesn't talk a whole lot about marriage, but he does in Matthew nineteen, where he does, and that that whole passage is fascinating. In all a bunch of different reasons, but Jesus is, you know, marriage is for life. What God has joined together, man must not put asunder. Okay, Paul is, you know, a few decades after Jesus is very much in line with that teaching. Right, that if you get divorced and remarried then you're in a state of adultery by the way and don't raise your hands but like if you're in that condition okay come and set up a meeting with me okay like let's take care of that okay um you know we can yeah that's different subject but um and so yeah his point is the woman is free to remarry upon the death of her husband okay so what's the analogy then verse four likewise my brothers my brethren you have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, 
to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So what's his point? Okay. Since we have died in Christ, remember he said, do you not know that you who were baptized were baptized into his death? That was in chapter six. So we who were baptized into his death, what has he died to? Sin, the old man, the old way of being human. Okay. Uh, so we have we who have died with Christ have also died to sin. We are no longer under the law of sin. If if sin and death was our our abusive husband, okay, well he died. Right? We're no longer to use the analogy. Okay. It also can mean okay. It also he's going to be talking about we are no longer bound to the old covenant, the old law. It could also be read that way. Paul is kind of playing on both these levels. The Jews were under the old law, but now the old law is no longer. Jesus has established the new law, the new covenant. So just like how, you know, if, if you think of the old law as our first husband, right? Well, now under the new law, the old law is dead, is no longer applies. Okay. Just like how you can get remarried if your spouse dies. Uh, verse 5, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. We're going to talk, I won't deal with this here. We're going to talk more. We have been talking about how the law like makes us more aware of sin <laughs> and makes us more guilty. Not that the law is bad, but you know, if I say don't do that <laughs> and you didn't know any better, well, now you know better. So if you do it, it's even worse. <laughs> okay. That kind of idea. We're going to come back to that idea in verse 6. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. So you could read it both ways. Paul's contrasting us being under the law of sin and death, and now we're in the new law of Christ, or we were under the old, if we were the Jews particularly, we were under the old old law of Moses, now we're under a new law, a new regime. And also, uh, he's implying, and this is another theme in St. Paul, not necessarily in Romans, but it's implied here, it's in the background, uh, we have been espoused to a new husband, to Christ. Okay, um, that's he, he develops that in other letters, but it's certainly in the background of what he's saying. That's another level that you could read this part on. This is a major theme throughout the Old Testament. Okay, uh, throughout the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. God, throughout the Old Testament, wants to wed himself to his people. And the people are not faithful. Therefore, in the Old Testament, this is a big theme in the Old Testament, idolatry is equated with adultery. They're like synonymous. Unfaithfulness to God, idolatry, is adultery, spiritual adultery. Okay, um, So what does God do? He comes as Jesus, the divine bridegroom, to save his bride, us. And then this theme is brought up in the letters of St. Paul, and then it's uh, brought up, it's the end of the Bible, Revelation. We talked about that last year. God's marriage covenant with his people is a unifying theme of the Bible. That's a big statement. You can read the entire Bible as a, the marriage covenant of God and his people. So marriage is an extremely important, um, not just theme of the Bible, but theme of what we believe the meaning of everything is. Everything finds meaning in the marriage of God with humanity. Okay? That, it, that is enacted how? Definitively through Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, so now what Paul is going to do in this rest of chapter 7, he's going to contrast the old marriage... <laughs> The law of the old law, or the law of sin, okay, the law or the law that caused more sin, okay, not that the law is bad, but it caused it right, versus the new marriage, which is the new law in the spirit, okay, and the spirit, which has been kind of in the background this whole time, is going to eventually, eventually tonight, pop out and kind of take center stage. Is like what? Here's the preview, right, of tonight. Spoiler, okay. Um, what? is the new humanity in Christ the spirit of God that lives in the believers, the faithful, those who have faith, right? That the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God is working in those who believe to make them righteous. Okay. 
we'll get there in chapter eight. Okay. But in the meantime, we're going to kind of have a mini arc here where we <laughs> appreciate the bad news before we go into the good. Again, kind of on a miniature level. We've been doing that, right? But we have a little mini one here in verse chapter seven and eight. Okay. So verse seven, what then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I should not have known sin. I should not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So, Paul, again, Paul is emphasizing that the law is good. Why? Because it comes from God. And the law produces, is, is the pathway to righteousness. Right? But what happened? <laughs> okay? The law only made us, particularly, well, us meaning God's people, the Jews, only more aware of sin. Was it able to stop the Israelites from sinning? By no means. Right? It's good, but in some ways it just made it worse. Okay, uh, And Paul is saying, you know, he uses the example here of, I would not know what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. He's referring to the ninth and the 10th commandments Okay, in Catholic enumeration, right? which is based on Deuteronomy. Um, so what is that saying? Paul is, I think, intentionally appealing to not an external covenant. I mean, he could have said, you know, I wouldn't have known what it is to not steal or commit adultery. Right? No, he goes with covet because those are the two commandments of the seven that deal not just with external actions, but interior dispositions. It's not enough to just say, I didn't steal today. <laughs> it's not enough to simply say, I didn't commit adultery today. I mean, think about, you know, if you came home to your parents or your spouse or whatever and said, you know, hey, mom and dad, I didn't steal anything today. They'd be like, well, was that a option today? You know, like, was that a, was that a question? Or if you came home to your spouse, it's like, hey, honey, no adultery today. <laughs> like, well, okay. <laughs> like, good for you, right? Like, no, why? Because it's not enough to just not do it. It's, I don't want to do it. I don't want to steal. I don't want to commit adultery, to be unfaithful in those ways. That's where, in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, like, yes, he's doubling down, but he's also echoing what was already in the Ten Commandments, right? You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And by the way, when he says, you have heard that it was said, who is he referring to? Moses. But I say to you, which this is lost on us, but to the Israelites, what he's saying is, I'm a bigger deal than Moses. Who's a bigger deal than Moses? God. It's an it's a implicit claim to divinity when he says that. And he says that over and over in the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, by the way, is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Okay, the greatest sermon ever preached, right? The best summary of Jesus' teaching that we have in the, in the Gospels. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, because I'm greater than Moses, that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Like, dang, I thought I was doing pretty good. Like, I hadn't committed adultery. I mean, I want to, but like, you know. <laughs> right, but, but what's, what's he getting at, okay? Where's your heart, <laughs> okay? And that was, and again, that was already in the old law. That's why... Perfect love, right, fulfills the law. Because what God was trying to do with Israel in the Old Testament was not just to get them to have right conduct. Okay, Yes, that's part of it. But he wanted to fix their hearts. We're going to get into that. Paul's going to get into that. What's our problem? What's our problem as human beings? It's not just that we have bad conduct. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. What's the source of that? It's much deeper than that. We have rotten hearts. Okay, we're gonna get into that. That's what that's what he's getting into. Okay, um, let's uh, yeah continue verse eight. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, wrought in me all kinds of covetedness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. Um, he's kind of he's using a rhetorical device here, uh, or literary device. He's personifying sin. Okay. He's kind of in these next few verses, he's treating sin as kind of this uh, predator lurking around, looking for opportunities to like cause you to sin. OK, so sin is what did sin do? Right. Sin saw the commandments, the law as an opportunity. Right. 
because now I can really, the sin in this personified way can make it worse because <laughs> you're going to know what you're supposed to do and you're not going to do it anyway, right? That's even worse, right? Um, our, our knowledge of something being wrong often doesn't stop us from doing it. In fact, it can make us want it all the more, right? Like, uh, you know, the child that learns where the cookie jar is, now they want a cookie, right? They didn't, th that's what Paul means by the law. Uh, what does he say in that last part? Of that? Apart from the law, sin lies dead. He's not saying that sin didn't exist without the law. I mean, uh, that was the whole thing in chapter one with the Gentiles. Like, they're, they've been lost for a long time, right? But the point is, is like, if you don't know where the cookie jar is, well, then, and to not take cookies from it, well, then you don't desire the cookie, right? But as soon as you tell the kid, hey, there's where the cookie jar is, now I want the cookie, right? Now I want the forbidden fruit. You could even use that, right? You know, um, and I'm not, not, I'm not saying that ignorance is bliss, but there, there, it's like the knowledge from the law then becomes what? An opportunity for this predator sin, right? Who's like, you know, now we're really going to mess with your heart, right? Because you're not going to do what's right. Or um, how about this? Okay, let's bring it into the adult world, all right? Let's say someone tells me they know some juicy detail about one of my friends or coworkers, okay? What do I do? I say, oh, that's, that's fine. No, it's like, no, tell me, right? I want to know, <laughs> right? You were ignorant of that before they told you, but now it's like, you know, yeah, what, what, what did they do, right? You know, you're, you're curious, right? I mean, how perverse we are, right? You know, it's like knowledge makes it worse. It'd be better if you just, why did you even tell me that? that they, now I want to know. Okay, what's the gossip, right? All right, uh, so what is Paul doing here? He's going to explore this interior conflict that is part of our fallen nature due to original sin, okay? It's part of life in the pit, <laughs> is that we have this interior conflict. Um, just a kind of a little bit of a philosophical aside, uh, Plato, the great philosopher, Greek philosopher, he thought that wrongdoing was simply a matter of ignorance. That if somebody does something wrong, it's simply because they're ignorant. Now, that can be true, okay? Uh, but I think Paul shows that our problem is not ignorance of the mind. It's not just the law. If Israel had followed the law, they would have been fine. They knew They did know better. Uh, but rather, what's the problem? It's not a problem of the head. It's a problem of the heart. Okay? In that sense, Plato was wrong, okay? which is saying something. I mean, he was right on a, a lot of things. But, but in that sense, knowledge being the simple problem, to, if you know better, then you won't do it. Well, it's not really the issue because it's our hearts. All right. Okay, uh, verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The very commandment which promised life proved to be death for me. This is the irony of the people of Israel. By receiving God's laws, it only made it worse for them because they couldn't follow it. Okay. And uh, by the way, like I don't know if you've ever considered this, but the Old Testament ends unfulfilled. If you just had the Old Testament, which even Jews today just have the Old Testament, it is a story that is dot, dot, dot. Right? has a lot of promises, a lot of buildup, but it doesn't have an ending. It's an open-ended story if you just have the Old Testament. And I would go even further and say, without the New Testament, the Old Testament is a tragedy of the highest order. Because what's the problem? God has given special attention and care to this people, and even they can't get it. So if they can't get it? Well, then there's no hope for the rest of us dirty thinking Gentiles, right? I mean, we're, we're far gone. Like, you see the tragedy there, right? It's like the tragedy is uh, we, can't, we can't get out of the pit, right? The Old Testament ends with none of this. <laughs> and not only that, but like God has tried to instruct the people how to get out of the pit, and it can't happen repeatedly. Even Israel's best kings and leaders, right? David and Solomon are considered, and they are, the best kings in Israel history. But one was an adulterer and murderer, and the other one was, you know, rich and, and problems with all kinds of stuff, right? Um, you know, they, they were, they, they can't, they can't do it, right? They can't 
They, they, they succumb to the same disease that all the rest of us have. Okay, you see the tragedy there? It's even worse, okay? Um, the other thing that I need to mention, okay, and this is going to follow for the rest of chapter 7, Paul's use of the first person here, okay? Uh, what is this I that, he's, that he starts talking about? I was once alive, then I died. The very commandment which promised life proved to be death to me, okay? Now, there's a few options. It's not, a, it's not totally clear. But again, and I think that this, and we should be very comfortable with this as biblical readers, it's okay for Paul to intend, and even, and even more so, for God to intend multiple levels at the same time, okay? It doesn't have to be, this is what he means, therefore that's the end. Especially when God brings in, you know, it's the word of God, God can have something mean something on multiple levels. So on one level, Paul could be talking about his personal history as a Jew, right? That when I was under the law, I still sin, okay? Um, that's, that's possible. He could also be talking about just biblical history in general. He's talking about the story of Israel in general and how, you know, they, the commandment that was supposed to give life could only produce more death. Um, or he could just be talking about human history in general. Okay? I, I think probably just human condition in general is probably his, his most primary meaning. But the other two are not only possible, but also can be going on at the same time. Okay? And that's okay with Scripture. Not only is that okay, but... That's often how scripture works. Even if Paul's original meaning was very specific, God, because it's the word of God, can give multiple meanings to the same passage. So we can read this as Paul talking about his personal history, the story of Israel, and the story of humanity in general at the same time. And there's no contradiction there because it applies to all of them, right? And it's God who orchestrates that, okay? That's true with scripture in general, not just with um, St. Paul, okay? Um, but it's important to know that he's talking generally, right, not about a specific sin. He's talking about the human condition, okay? And he's going to get into this interior, this kind of interior dialogue, right? Again, possibly talking about his own interior dialogue, also applies to Israel, also just applies to all of us in general, okay? Um, I think overall, right, yeah, so, well, yeah, so we'll just get into it, okay? Uh, verse 11, for sin... Finding opportunity in the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Again, reiterating, the law is good. I think kind of like, you know, you could think about this as like well, the sin is like the serpent right, lurking in the garden. The garden is good. The fruit is good. Even the tree of knowledge of good and evil is good. But the serpent, the original rebellion, re, re, original one who rebelled against God, He's lurking, and he uses the good things of God, this beautiful garden with this man and woman, as an opportunity for corruption and evil. Okay, well, sin has been doing the same thing ever since. Okay, uh, in the case of the the law, but again, he reiterates the law is good, the law is holy. Um, we don't want to have, and sometimes you can get this not so much in Catholic circles, but in certain circles, <laughs> law is bad, grace is good. Like that's not that's not what Paul's teaching, and that's not what we believe. Okay, the law is good, even if it was a cause for sin, not because of it was bad, but because it made things worse. Because if you know better and you can't follow the law, then you're worse off. Okay, that's Paul's point. All right. Um, also, uh, you know, there's kind of well, here let, let, we'll get into that in a second. Okay, verse thirteen. Uh, so this is so now Paul's going to go into this kind of interior dialogue between the conflict and and I think by the way like hopefully we can recognize this in ourselves right <laughs> I think he does a really good job Paul in this particular passage of giving us a dialogue an interior dialogue that explains the condition of original sin right so what is it how does it work okay verse thirteen did that which is good then bring death to me by no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So Paul's saying, you know, again, the law is not the problem. Sin is the culprit, like the rotten part of an apple. Okay? The apple is good. The part that's bad is the rotten part, kind of taking opportunity of the fact that there's an apple to begin with. Um, this is, uh, if we want to, uh, and I've mentioned this in the past, but uh, evil on its own doesn't exist. 
And what I mean by that is evil presumes there's something good that can be corrupted. You don't have evil unless you have something that's good first. You don't have a rotten apple unless you have an apple. You don't have a cavity in your tooth unless you first have a tooth. You don't have evil unless there is something good for it to leech off of. Okay. The technical way to say this is evil is a privation of good. It's not that good and evil are opposite and opposed forces. Okay. Evil, another way to say it is evil is a lack of good that should be present. Okay. If I don't have an arm, we would say that's evil. Not that I'm evil, but the, the fact that I don't have an arm would be evil. Why? Because that's a lack of good that should be present. On a healthy human being, you have an arm. If I said, well, then is it evil for a jellyfish to not have an arm? No, because jellyfish aren't the kind of creatures that have arms. That's not a lack of good that should, well, they have the, whatever, the tentacles, you know, but you know what I'm saying. They don't have, they don't have an arm like, or eyes, whatever. Evil is a lack of good that should be present. Or again, think about it like darkness and light. There's no, there's no such thing as a dark light in the sense of like, you know, here, let me shine this darkness on you, okay? Darkness is a absence of light. Darkness itself on, on doesn't exist. It's just an absence of what should be there, okay? Even Satan. Satan is good in that he's a creature created by God and he was created to be good. He became evil because he chose to be less than what he was created to be. There's a lack of good in Satan that should be present, but he chose to empty himself of any goodness. Same thing with human beings. Okay? An evil human being is not fundamentally evil because they're a creature of God, they're good. But through their own choices, through their character, they have become a shell of themselves. It's a lack of good that should be present, okay? So again, like what is, what is right? That's what Paul's talking about here, right? Sin working death in me through what is good. Uh, evil is opportunistic. You know, a great, uh, a great, uh, fantasy world that does this principle really well is the Lord of the Rings, okay? Uh, the orcs, I know, and I know there's more, like, complicated history in Tolkien's lore, but, like, the orcs are corrupted elves. Sauron, okay, and, and J.R.R. Tolkien, because J.R.R. Tolkien was Catholic, okay, he had this principle of evil as a lack of good that should be there, a privation of good, very much throughout the Lord of the Rings lore. So, all that Sauron can do, the Dark Lord, he can only take good things and twist to them. He can't actually create like pure evil things. He can only take the good things that the good power has created and twist them. So orcs are disfigured, corrupted elves. Okay, like for example, right? Um, there's all kinds of other examples like that in Lord of the Rings, but um, why? Because creation is fundamentally good because it comes from God. We, we don't have time to get into the problem of evil, but, but that's, that's part of what Paul's kind of saying here. This personification of evil as a predator is opportunistic. Satan was opportunistic. He took the good things that were in the garden and corrupted them. Okay? And, even, and again, it applies to people. It applies to angels. Okay? All demons are angels that are fallen, less than what they should be. Okay? All right. Um, so what does Paul say, though? It's like... <laughs> Uh, one of the ways in which Paul says the, the law or the commandment kind of functions here is the law was almost like bait to get sin to kind of come out in, uh, from the shadow and sh expose itself for what it really is. It's like, you know, we have the law and now we see like sin for what it is. Like, yeah, it's pretty bad, right? It's not just that we have bad actions, we have bad hearts. Well, we know that because of the law and the history of Israel. Okay. All right, verse 14. Uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Uh, this doesn't mean that the body is bad, okay? But it's that our souls and our bodies don't cooperate the way that they're supposed to. Um, 
I really find this helpful. Um, in, in God's original plan, the soul was meant to serve God. Okay. The body was meant to serve the soul. So this is the human being right here. Okay. We are body and soul. But within our body and soul, there is a hierarchy. Okay. The soul is higher than the body. That doesn't mean the body's bad. But the soul should be in the driver's seat, not the body. Okay. And in original justice, when Adam and Eve were up here, this was all in harmony. The soul obeyed God. The body obeyed the soul. I mean, can you imagine if your body and your soul were just perfectly in sync? Like what you wanted, wanted is what you desired, and you just, it was like life came easy to you. That's how it was in the garden, right? The body is good, but it's lower than the soul, and it's meant to serve the soul. And then material goods, the garden was all good. The things of the world were all good, but they were meant to serve the body. Okay. Well, what happened? Adam and, what, what, when Adam and Eve sinned, it was a sin of disobedience. It was not, as some people sometimes erroneously posit, it was not a sin of the flesh. Okay. It was not. A, it had nothing to do with sex or lust. Okay. Why? Because the body was in complete harmony with the soul. Their soul was a spiritual, and much worse, it was a spiritual disobedience. It was saying no to God. The soul was supposed to say yes to God, and they said no. Well, so what happened? It had a cascading effect. <laughs> when the soul says no to God, the body says, well, why do I have to listen to you? <laughs> so the body rebelled against the soul. <laughs> the body says, well, I know what I want. I want to feel good, and that's what I want. <laughs> Why do I have to listen to you, soul, if you don't listen to God? Okay. So there's a rebellion of the soul against the body. But there was also then what happened? Well, there was an enslavement of the body to material goods. So lust and gluttony probably being the most obvious, right? Where I can actually become a slave to my desires. I can abuse the things of the world. These are all good. The things of the world are good things, okay? There's nothing wrong with bacon, right? It's great, okay? But if you eat too much bacon, if your body is a slave to bacon, that's not good, okay? The bacon is meant to serve your body, not the other way around, okay? So this particular, where we feel, particularly in us, within the human being, right? So our bodies are slaves to material goods. Our souls have rebelled against God, okay? Again, that's the nature that we inherited. That's the nature that Adam and Eve passed down, was a fallen nature. Okay? But if we focus in on this relationship, we feel within ourselves now a war between our bodies and our souls. Because <laughs> right? again, my body knows what it wants. It wants to be well-fed and feel good and get a good night's sleep. And, you know, like, you know, I, I, I smell some bacon and my body's like, eat that bacon. Right? Okay? Even if my soul, my intellect, and my will are like, I shouldn't be eating that bacon, right? I've had too much. I've had enough. Okay? So we experience within ourselves a war amongst ourselves. Adam and Eve didn't have to deal with that. So this, this, particular, um, this particular conflict in, in, the, in classical terminology, is called concupiscence. This war between the body and the soul. Concupiscence just means, it's just a fancy word that means desire. The desires of our bodies don't align with the desires of our souls. Welcome to the human condition, right? Okay. And so that's what Paul's point. By the way, I and I mean to give it some happy, a happy ending, okay. Does anybody know why? Um, why poverty, chastity, and obedience? Do you know what those are? What are poverty, chastity, and obedience? The evan they're close. The evangelical councils. They're called the evangelical councils, okay? Or the three vows that religious take. Do you know why why those three? Did the church just one day wake up and say, like, you know what? Let's have them do poverty, chastity, and obedience. That'll work, you know? No, those are the those are the three evangelical councils, okay? Why? Well, 
poverty is meant to counteract this tendency of the body to be enslaved to material goods. The vow of poverty is meant to counteract the body's tendency to be enslaved by material goods. Not because material goods are bad, but because they can enslave us. Wealth can enslave us. Things can enslave us. So poverty is the vow that is meant to counteract this kind of this rebellion. Okay. The soul, the body's rebellion against the soul, this internal conflict called concupiscence. It is true that while concupiscence can refer to any wayward desires, it does have a particular connotation to sexual desire. Okay. Does it's not limited to that, but it's included in that. Why? Because that's one of the strongest desires that human beings have. Okay. Is there anything wrong with that, by the way? No. Is that how God created it? Yes. Okay. God loves babies. Okay. <laughs> However, when we turn that desire into a like pleasure for its own sake, it becomes a problem. And you can extrapolate to all kinds of things that the body rebels against the soul. So what is the vow that counteracts this tendency of the body against the soul? Chastity. Chastity is not Puritanism. It's not suppressing my sexual desire so that it comes out later in some weird form or something, right? Okay. Chastity is the moderation of sexual desire. Chastity is possession of myself in matters of sex and sexual pleasure so that I can give myself away in love in whatever state in life that I'm called to. <laughs> in my, my high school students, I will ask them, I will even explain to them what chastity is, and then I'll, say, I'll ask them, I'll say, so is everybody called to be chaste? And they'll say, no. <laughs> it's like, it's like, like, no. Like, no, everybody's called to chastity, right? Because everyone is called to have moderation in matters of sex and sexual pleasure in accordance with their state in life, okay? Self-possession so that I can give myself away in love. In the case of someone who's married, to their spouse. In the case of a celibate priest, not in a sexual way, in, a, in, in that way, but to give themselves away to their people. Okay. Um, in the case of someone who's single, to be able to give themselves away fully to their future spouse or their future vocation. Right. Self-possession so that I can give myself. I can't give what I don't have. Right. If I have no control in matters of chastity, well, then I, I can't give myself away fully in love, right? Okay, but what's the hardest vow? It's not chastity, actually. If you ask any religious, it's not, you know, the soul rebelled against God. What was Adam and Eve's original sin? It was not a sin against chastity, okay? They didn't have to deal with this conflict yet. This is an effect of the fall, not the cause of it. What's the, what's the primordial sin? Oh, and what's the, yeah, well, and then what, disobedience. And then what's the vow that's the remedy? Obedience. So for the religious, the vow of obedience is meant to counteract the soul's rebellion against God. And that's the hardest vow, and it's the most important, okay? I mean, you know, they all go together, but like, you know, if, if you struggle in obedience, then that's that's more serious than struggling in the other two. Okay. They're all bad, but like, but these are, these are the remedies. Okay. These are the remedies. Now, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Does that only apply to religious? No. If you look at the, if you look at the catechism, I don't know what paragraph off the top of my head, the catechism talks about these three the, called the evangelical councils. All, the Catechism says that everyone is called to practice the evangelical counsels in accordance with their state in life. All of us, I don't care if you're a priest, religious, married, single, young, old, have to practice some level of poverty. We have to have sufficient detachment from the goods of this world. Yes, the religious person takes a vow of poverty so that they don't have any possessions. It doesn't mean poverty in that like you have no possessions, but you need to be sufficiently detached from material goods. Otherwise, you'll be enslaved by the things of the world. 
So that includes what, right? For, for a lay person, right, who's not a religious, that would include things like living within your means, tithing, giving to the poor, um, you know, being generous with others. I don't, I, I, it's not like, you know, well, I'm not a monk or a nun, so I can just let, I can, I can have it all, right? And I can be greedy, right? No, you have to have poverty. You have to live out the evangelical of poverty in accordance with your state in life, okay? Be detached from your, you can have material goods, but don't let them enslave you. Jesus has a lot of warnings, right, against people who are enslaved by material goods. And that should be a warning to all of us in our society because all of us, are in like the top 1% of people in the history of the world in terms of wealth, right? Even if you're not particularly wealthy in our country, everybody in our country is in the top like 1% of people of all time, right? Okay, so that's a particular obstacle to us, okay? Um, again, I already said this one, right? Everybody is called to chastity. Not everybody is called to renounce marriage, okay? And by the way, priests, religious don't renounce marriage because it's bad. They renounce it because it's good. You don't sacrifice something that's bad, okay? When you're giving up stuff for Lent, you know, you don't say like, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna give up my favorite sin, right? <laughs> I'm going to give up uh, swearing, right? Well, you should be doing that anyway, okay? Lent is the time to do like positive acts of more, like I'm going to give up chocolate, okay? Because it's a sacrifice for me. It's a good thing that I'm going to sacrifice. Uh, the priest or religious gives up marriage. Not because it's a bad thing, because it's a good thing, because it's a sacrifice. Otherwise, you know, yeah, you if well, if it was a bad thing, then we wouldn't have the sacrament of marriage, right? <laughs> but are all people called to, so not everybody is called to be celibate, to renounce marriage, but are all called to be chaste in accordance with their state in life? Absolutely. If you're not, your your body, your passions are are what are driving the driving the wagon, not your soul, and that's bad. All right, so lastly, okay, none of you all take a, no, a vow of obedience to a religious superior, but do you need to practice obedience in your life? Absolutely, right? Obedience to God, first and foremost, okay? It's like, oh, yeah, that's easy. Like, I obey God. Well, okay, but what if there's some hard sayings, of God, hard teachings, of hard commandments, right? Also, part of that is the church, okay? Obedience to the church. Why? Because it's the bride of Christ. It's God's, uh, God's uh, institution that he ins instituted on earth, right? To teach us and to lead his holy mother church. So I can't just say like, you know, you know what? Like, I don't feel like fasting before mass today. I do my own thing, right? That's a lack of obedience, right? Okay. Now, as a priest, I, you know, it like builds on to that, right? I make a promise of obedience to my bishop and that kind of stuff. You guys don't have that. But even in that sense, right, if the bishop has us do something, we need to do it, right? You know, if he says, uh, you, we're going to say an Our Father, Hail Mary, and a Glory Be after Mass to pray against a constitutional initiative, well, then we need to do it, right? It's like, well, I don't need to do that, you know? It's like, well, <laughs> at the very least, you're struggling in obedience, okay? <laughs> Um, obedience is, is a really important thing to get it, you know, uh, man, like if you, you know, talk about mortification, right? Uh, like, yeah, chastity and poverty are hard enough, but mortifying my own will, that's a lot tougher, right? We have this, of all these three, I want to have it my way, right? Letting go of that's very tough if you've ever tried to do that, right? <laughs> Because it's like, because I want what I want, right? Well, there you go. Like, that's it. So anyway, I bring this up. You know, yes, for the religious, they take vows of these three things. But they apply to all of us. The catechism says we all need to live the evangelical counsels in accordance with our state in life. Why? Because they're the remedies for the disease that we all have. We all have this rebellion on these three levels. These three things are what undo that, okay? All right. That's a little bit of an aside, but it does play in right to what Paul is talking about. What he's going to specifically focus on is this kind of war between this interior conflict between my, my, uh, the, the, what he's going to call the spirit and the flesh, okay? My body and my soul. They're not always on the same page, okay? Uh, let's see, where are we at? We are on verse 15, yeah. I do not understand my own actions. 
For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Sound familiar? Right? I know I shouldn't have that extra piece of chocolate cake, but oh, it'd be so good, right? It'd be so yummy. That's a conflict between my soul, my intellect, my intellect and will. I know that's the, I shouldn't do that. I'm going to get sick versus my body, right? My body does not. Adam and Eve, they would have been like, yeah, I've had enough chocolate cake. In the, in the, when they were up here in the original justice, they would have said, yeah, that cake was good, but I'm satisfied. I don't, I'm good. And the body would have went along with that, okay? And then you can extrapolate to others, your favorite sin, okay? Um. Verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. And, and I don't think Paul's not saying this because he's blaming sin. He's kind, of, he's kind of using, again, this sin personified as like this predator that lives with inside him, right? <laughs> this disease. I, he's not saying that I'm not culpable, right? But it's like I see within me like sin is lurking always. It's It's... I can't get rid of the disease, okay? Verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. Again, contra Plato, right? That it's not just a matter of knowing is not enough, right? Just knowing what the right thing is isn't enough to get you to do it. Because what's going on? Sin is lurking, right? <laughs> Saying like, no, you really do want that chocolate cake, right? <laughs> Yeah, I do. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. All right. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. Again, it's kind of like Paul is like searching this his interior for us, right? And it applies to all of us, right? And he's like, wherever I look, there's sin right? Lurking. I can't get away from it. And, and like how, I mean, like, there you go, right? That's, that's the human condition, is it not? Right? That's what we struggle with always. Everybody that you see in the room, right, is having an interior dialogue, right? I mean, I mean, think about, well, first of all, think about this, like how strange we are compared to other animals. You know, like you feed a dog and you give it like a place to sleep and like, it's fine. It doesn't sit there struggling with itself, right? <laughs> right? But a human being, right? You feed a human being and you give them shelter, right? And then it's like, I could be better, right? <laughs> like, or I want that more chocolate cake or whatever, you know? Like, I, I know I shouldn't want that, but I want it, right? Um, like, we don't fit in with the other creature. Why? Because something went amiss in us because of our free will, right? You know? Um, but a dog or a cat, right? Like they're fine, you know, even when they're in like relatively traumatic situations, they're like, well, it is what it is. Right. You know, but with us, you know, um, you know, I think, yeah, what else? Let's see. Um, it, you know, also I think you could say don't most, if not all of our psychological neuroses come from this, right. Uh, from this discrepancy between what I want to do and what I want to do right? between my desires and what I know I should do or or even just that right the person that I am versus the person that I know I should be man there's a cause of a lot of anxiety stress self-loathing guilt right well we all have it okay that's why we chuckle about it right we tend to forget that other people have it too sometimes right <laughs> but like Paul's Paul's getting into this interior dialogue that we all have right Okay. And again, he's not blaming the sin. It's just saying that like the sin lives within me and I can't get rid of it, right? The disease is very deep seated. Okay. All right, let's keep moving. Verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. A law in the sense of like the law that I live under is like every time I want to do good, there's sin like lurking along, right? For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. I want to do God's law. I love God. I want to do what he wants. Okay. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin which dwells in my members. 
wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Right? Can you hear the, the like, anguish of the human condition that Paul's describing here? You know, why can't I be the person I should be? Instead, I'm this. <laughs> and I'm like, I, that tortures me, right? It causes all kinds of problems in my personal life, in my interior life, in my relationship with God, my relationship with work and everything and the kids. And, like, you know, it's like, right? There's like this, this deep anguish, okay? All right. We cannot, another way to say it, right? We cannot save ourselves. There's a law at work in us that can only lead to death. So who will save me? Not me, obviously. I don't know if modern people have really come to grips. And by modern people, I mean like people in our secular modern culture, right? I don't know if we've really come to grips. I don't think we have. Of how we need saving and we can't do it. We want to ignore this wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. We want to ignore that, right? Pretend like it's not there or pretend like we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, right? I would say that characterizes our modern world. And we don't come to grips with that, okay? But, okay, we've had this kind of mini bad news, right? But now here's the turning point, okay? Here's the good news. Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Exclamation point. Okay. So then I of myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. I think what Paul's in this last part of that, I mean, there's the first part of the verse, thanks be to God through our through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? He is the answer. Now in verse now in chapter eight, we're gonna really blow that top off and talk about that, okay? But uh to finish chapter seven, he's saying, you know, yeah, even even as Christians, right, we're still going to have to grapple with this conflict. But now we have the grace of Jesus Christ. And even more so than that, we have his spirit with a capital S. And now this is where the spirit is going to kind of come to center stage. And Paul's going to talk about how the spirit of God that dwells within you who believe is making you righteous. Okay. So we finally get to chapter 8. Okay, so if chapter 7 lays out the problem, chapter 8 lays out the divine solution orchestrated by God. And if I had to put it in a sentence, okay, I would say it's the pouring out of God's Holy Spirit that has come to us through Jesus Christ. Okay, The Spirit is the presence and the power of God that it lives within the life of the believer. And as I mentioned, chapter 8 of Romans is one of the most beautiful, profound, and uplifting chapters in all of Pauline literature, and I would say, indeed, all of sacred scripture. Okay, uh, if, you're having a, if you're getting discouraged in your faith, or if you're having a bad day, read Romans chapter 8. It can put it in perspective. Okay, God, because Paul is going to show us how, how abundant and wonderful God's love is through the outpouring of the Spirit that has come to us through his Son. Notice there that Paul is going to here, and you'll see this, notice it as we go along, there's an interplay between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? God the Father sends his Son, and through the Son comes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. Um, and, and also chapter 8 is the capstone of this section. So this is also a really good place to end before we go on our little break, right? Because we'll have a, a kind of a new section. But this whole section that started in chapter 5 of unpacking what does this new humanity in Christ mean, here we get, here, here it comes home, okay? So let's, let's read it. All right. Chapter 8, verse 1. Just this first verse is great. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, just like take that verse to prayer and just like meditate on that, right? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a breakthrough sentence, right? This is the, the chapter seven was a little bit more somber, right? Kind of this anguish, right? Now it's like, you know, go team, go team Jesus, right? Okay. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. 
we've been talking this whole time about how the law of sin and death has been hanging over our head as a collective, right? What does he say? The law of the spirit, spirit with a capital S, at least in my translation, of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, God's solution is the Father sent his Son who has poured out his Spirit into the hearts of believers. This, by the way, this did not come out of nowhere. Okay, in the Old Testament, there are multiple passages where God promises to pour out his Spirit on his people. Uh, most notably, I'll, I'll just mention two examples. There's a passage in Ezekiel and a passage in Jeremiah where God promises that I will pour out my Spirit. Well, when does that, Paul, what part of what Paul's realizing, right, as an evangelist over these course of years, it's like that time is now. Now the Spirit is being poured out into the hearts of believers. There's a new and definitive law written not in tablets of stone, but on our hearts, okay, in our hearts of flesh. In that we not only do the good, but we want to do the good. Why? Because of the Spirit of God that lives within our hearts, okay. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How did God destroy the law of sin and death? Not because you and I all of a sudden are able to do it, but because he condemned sin and death in the flesh, in the body of Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus, in other words, Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. If you want to go back to this analogy, right? Jesus is able to go up the cross what we could not do for ourselves. That's, and, he, and he did it not just as God, but also as man. Note, see why the incarnation is so important, right? Jesus became man and killed sin and death as a man. Yes, as God, but as a man as well. In his flesh, which is same as our flesh, he put sin to death. Okay, Why? Because he made a perfect act of love and resisted sin and temptation. Okay, And what he has done is now imputed to us through his grace. Okay, He took on, our, and, and what does it mean? He condemned sin in the flesh. Uh, he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. Paul's not saying that Jesus was sinful, but that he took on our humanity and all of its you know, all of its struggles, but was without sin. And he was able to give back to God a perfect act of love, something that we could, were unable to do. So he loves God on our behalf perfectly, right, as a man. Okay? It also, um, when it says, and for sin, there's also a, um, a hint Paul's putting in there is it that he came as a sin offering. So in the Old Testament, you had certain offerings that were for sin, a sin offering. Jesus is the definitive sin offering in that he takes, because what did the sin offering do in the Old Testament? It, it took away your sins, right? That was what it was. There's other types of offerings. There's offerings of thanksgiving and that kind of stuff. But the sin offering is this offering that took away sins. Jesus came for sin because he took away sin and reconciled us to God. Jesus means, by the way, Yahweh, Yahweh saves. Okay. What does he save us from? Sin. Okay. And note that he says, Paul says, um, let's see, where is it? In, uh, at the end of verse 4, or at the beginning of verse 4, in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Notice that Paul doesn't say, so that we might fulfill the law. Like, Jesus died so that we might fulfill the law. No, he says something more profound. He came and died for us so that the law might be fulfilled in us. It is something that is done in us. How? By God's Spirit. That's, what he's, that's his whole point here. Okay. In other words, another way to say that is, when it comes to your salvation, God is the primary actor, not you. That doesn't mean you don't play your part. You are a free instrument of God. And you can say no, We're gonna, we'll talk about that, but, but it, you don't have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You don't have to be worthy of God's love. You don't have to be a good boy or a good girl to get to heaven. 
because Jesus Christ came and died for your sins, the just requirement of the law is being fulfilled in you through the outpouring of his spirit. See the difference, right? Okay, there. I think that's an important distinction, right? It's 100% God and 100% you, okay? It's not like, it's not all God and not, none of me, but in different ways, okay? God is the primary actor. You are the instrument. If you're a free instrument, you can still say no, okay? But you don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to earn God's love, is another way to say it. You can't. It is God's free gift to you through his son, Jesus Christ, okay? All right, if we keep going, now what Paul's going to do in these next few verses is he's going to contrast two mindsets, okay? And this is, the, and even as Christians, this is kind of the, the space we live in between, right? And we got kind of, we got to choose. That's where our will does come in, okay? Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Notice how one of the questions that he's kept keeps bringing up, one of his objections is like, well, hey, if we have grace, let's just sin. And he's saying, oh, you're missing the point, right? Like those who focus on the things of the flesh, right, the sinful things are headed down that way, okay? It's not, grace is not a free pass in that sense, okay, or a license to sin, okay? That's a contrast with the mindset of a Christian, which is uh, having your mindset on the things of the spirit. Verse six, to set the mind on the flesh is death. Why? Because the wages of sin are de is death, right? But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Notice, you know, you have two roads, right? Just like Adam and Eve, by the way, okay? I give you a path of life and a path of death, okay? Verse seven, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what do we want to have? We want to have the mindset of set our minds on things of the spirit. That doesn't mean we won't struggle with this conflict between body and soul, but you know, it's our new life in Christ is not then licensed to focus on the things of the flesh, right? That's his point. And by the things of the flesh, we mean sin, okay? Because that leads to death, right? Uh, okay, uh, going to... Going to nine, okay. Now, now again, this is, and again, think about this in terms of like the Romans reading this. Paul is going to encourage them. But you, Christians, are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. If the spirit of God really dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. So he's encouraging, right, the Romans, the first Christians, and us by extension, right, to remember that we are not uh, live for the flesh, but we have the Spirit of God which dwells within us, okay, who is, again, working for our salvation. Um, and then uh, also um, this idea of, like, your bodies are dead to sin, but your spirits are alive because of righteousness. Um, if our spirits are alive in Christ through the Spirit with a capital S, then we can also hope slash expect that our bodies will be raised too. Okay, That's why at the extreme, and this is why we, we um, honor them, the martyrs were willing to even let their bodies go, right, for the sake of the true life of the Spirit. And in the end, they will receive their bodies back on the last day. Whereas it doesn't work the other way, right? If you kill the soul for the body, well, when the body dies, you have nothing left, right? But the spirit that is alive in Christ can then, we can then hope and expect to be raised on the last day, right? Uh, it, C.S. Lewis said, you know, if you, put, if you put second things first, you lose both first things and second things. But if you put first things first, you get both. If you, if you live according to the Spirit, right, then your body will be taken care of by God. Why? Because Christ rose in the flesh, okay? This isn't, we're not an esoteric religion where it's all spirit, right? No, we're, we believe in the resurrection of the body, okay? That's what he's getting at there, okay? Uh, verse 11, if the Spirit of him who raised, and this is where he's talking about it, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit, which dwells in you. If you die, but 
you're, if you die in the flesh, if your body decays and dies, right, but you have the spirit of Christ, then you can also hope to be raised to the resurrection with him, both body and soul, right? Okay. Verse 12. So then, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Again, against those people who are like, hey, grace is free. Let's go sin, you know? Okay. Um, but for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, put to death the deeds of the body. So in this life, there's a term for this. It, it's maybe not as popular in more recent times, but it still applies. The church still uses it. We got away from it probably a little bit too much. And there's definitely, you know, there can be a dark side to it, but mortification. Have you ever heard that word, right? Mortification. That doesn't mean that, you know, mortification is essentially discipline, right? Disciplining my body. There's another passage in Paul where he says, like, you know, I discipline my body, right? So that um, the desires of the flesh do not usurp what I know to be right, the soul, okay? Um, and he says, like, I, it's that passage, I don't remember what book. He says, like, I don't box as if I'm shadow boxing, right? I, I, I box so as to win, right? And so mortification, right? Uh, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, right? Those are forms of mortification. Curbing even our good desires, not because they're bad, but so that they don't become inflamed. Okay, that's mortification. That should be a regular part of our spiritual life, some forms of mortification. Okay? In the body, but if you want to get even more difficult, try mortifying your spirit, right? like your tongue. Okay? You know, like, like, I, uh, like gossip, right? Like, I, I really love to gossip. Well, try mortifying your tongue so that you don't say even things that are good to practice kind of exercising that spiritual no muscle so that you can say no when you need to, right? So mortification can actually work on a bodily and on a spiritual level too. But um, yeah, mortification, that's a word we probably need to bring back in our Catholic lexicon. All right. Um, okay, and then we continue on to... Uh, Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. So the sonship of Christ that he has by nature because he is the divine excuse me the divine son of the eternal father we have by we have that same sonship by grace the grace of adoption which has raised our status so Paul's saying we can and should rely on God as a trustful son or daughter relies on a good father and then this term abba Okay, I think we're probably most of us are familiar with that. Abba, Abba is Aramaic. Okay, that's the G, that's the language that Jesus would have spoke in day to day. Okay, Aramaic, and uh, so Abba is Aramaic for father, but it's an intimate and endearing term. Okay, sometimes you'll hear people say Abba is like saying Daddy. Okay, that's that's maybe like sort of. I mean, okay, like it maybe like a child saying Daddy. Okay, <laughs> not like an adult. If you're an adult and you call your dad Daddy, that's a little strange, right? But like a child calling their dad daddy, right? It's that kind of endearing, intimate form in Aramaic, as opposed to a more formal like father or even like sir, you know, or something like that, you know. Um, and, and what Jesus, we know from the Gospels, Jesus used Abba in his own prayer, okay? There are times in the Old Testament where the Jews refer to God as father, but Jesus makes that the normative way to address God. When you pray, say, our Father. Okay. That's not totally foreign to the Old Testament. There are instances where people call upon God as Father. I wouldn't say it's normative, though. For Jesus, it is the default position. God is Father, Abba. Okay. And where's another place that he says Abba? On the cross, right? Okay, that's important. Um. Also, too, uh, so how do we share? So how do we share in our inheritance? 
by being united with the Son in his sufferings. Okay, Just in case all of this has been really flowery, hopeful, nice rhetoric for you, right? Paul's like, no, it, it actually is still through the cross, right? This isn't just wishful thinking or wish fulfillment, okay? That our glory is in the sufferings of Christ that we share in when we unite our sufferings to him, okay? And he's going to, now he's going to go into another soliloquy on suffering, okay? I, and notice how, like, talking about the glory and the inheritance that we have through Jesus Christ, it's very natural for him to do that, to talk about suffering, right? Why? Because those things are connected. I said, I've said before, right? You can't get the resurrection without the cross. If somebody's trying to sell you the resurrection without the cross, they're trying to sell you something. You're probably in a cult, right? Okay. All right. So, so it's very natural. And he's done this earlier in the letter, but it's very natural for Paul to weave together the glory of Jesus Christ that we share in and we share in his sufferings. Okay. Um, the cross leads to the resurrection. So the glory to be revealed. In my translation, that's the that's the title of this next section, the glory to be revealed, and he's going to talk about suffering. Okay, so let's see how it works here. Okay, I consider that, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The suffer, in other words, the sufferings of the present are nothing in comparison to what God has in store. And I don't think Paul's saying that to take the teeth out of suffering. It doesn't mean suffering doesn't hurt. But if you're kind of looking at it as like a long-term cost-benefit analysis, right? It's like eternity does not compare with temporal suffering in terms of eternity blows it out of the water to an infinite degree. Again, that's not to take away from the real problems of human suffering. But if the Christians in Rome and ourselves are questioning at this point, like, well, does God lo really love me? Because I still have to suffer, right? Life sucks and then you die, right? <laughs> you know? Okay. So does God love me? Yes, is Paul's answer. Okay, and how do we know that? Right? Because the glory, the sufferings of the present are nothing compared to the glory to be revealed for us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will but by the will of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. In other words, the whole goal or the whole point of creation, that kind of eternal, ang you know, existential angst that we have and that we see all around us of like, we're just not, we just can't quite get there, right? That will all be revealed with the glory of the sons of God, right? That what we have in Jesus Christ, that's where it's all heading. That's where it all makes sense. Jesus, who is at the center, makes sense of all of the futility of creation. Okay, The futility of creation or the empty, that emptiness of creation that we just like, ugh, we just can't quite get there. That goes away when the glory of Jesus Christ and those who are with him is revealed. That's where it all heads, right? That's what Paul's saying here, right? Um, it, the futility of creation is temporary, okay? Even if, yes, we're still in the midst of it. We're still, we still experience that, that already but not yet, right? That tension of like, yes, we're already saved but not yet, okay? Um, and then he and he compares that to a kind of slavery, and then he and then you know as I like said, slave to to sin and death and decay, but will be set free. And then twenty two, we know that the whole creation has now been groaning with labor pains together until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Um, so he compares the kind of futility of creation to slavery, right? The Creation is captive to these forces of sin and death, but that it will be released from them when the glory of Jesus Christ is revealed, right? And, and for Paul, that's not just a future event. That's an event that's happening now, right? As grace is being poured out through Jesus Christ across time, the Spirit is being poured out. And then what does he do? He compares the futility of creation or the groaning, the longing of creation to labor pains, okay? All creation knows that there's something amiss, right? Even secular people, right, know that, like, we just can't get it right. 
okay? And we want new, uncorrupted, everlasting life. And Paul compares this to labor pains, okay? Why? Well, first, it ties Paul's dialogue back to what? Eve's punishment, right? Which, if you remember, I said that was her punishment for, um, for the garden, right? In pain shall you bring forth children. But I remember saying last week that Eve's punishment, and Adam's, by the way, but their punishment is also a lesson, right? Her punishment was a lesson about what? Redemptive suffering, okay? The suffering of labor and labor pains gives way to the joy of the birth of a new child, to new life, okay? So that the suffering melts away, right? And the mother says, I would do it all again, right? Because of the joy of having my child, right? So what is Paul saying by drawing that analogy? I mean, again, he's tying us back to the fall, but also the sufferings that we now experience will be worth it, right? That when we're on the side of heaven, right? When we're up here, we'll be like, wow, like God used my sufferings to bring about a greater joy that I couldn't imagine, right? Like a mother, especially who's never had a child before, who is like going through, it's like, I don't know if this pregnancy thing was worth it, right? Well, once she has the child, it's like, it was all worth it. And it only came about due to this kind of suffering, right? That's the lesson, right? Um, and then this idea of the first fruits. The first fruits um, is your, uh, the first part of your crop, right? And you're supposed to give the first fruits to God, right? To give the best to him. Well, the first fruits of us, right? What does he say? Is um, uh, the first fruits of the spirit, right? That, we, that we're experiencing. We, we don't have the full harvest yet, right? That comes in heaven. But even in this life, we experience the first, first fruits. We experience, I would say, this is a different letter of Paul, but how about we experience the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That's a taste of heaven. And that's just the first fruits. That's not the whole harvest, right? So again, it's that sense of already, but not yet. Okay, we're, we are, are, you saved? are you saved? Yes. Have you been saved? Yes. Are you being saved? Yes. Will you be saved? Yes. It's all three. Okay, we talked about that as well. Um, all right, continuing, uh, verse 24. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? In other words, if you, if you were in heaven, then you wouldn't need to hope for heaven because you'd be there, right? Part of what makes hope hope is it's not here yet. So we shouldn't be shocked that we need hope because we're not there yet, right? Um, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it in patience, okay? Um, and notice this is the opposite of the despair and the angst that was in chapter 7, right? Oh, wretched man am I. What, 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 who will save me from this body of death, right? Well, one of the fruits of the Spirit that is within us is hope. Not in ourselves, but in God, who has given us this grace and the Spirit through Jesus Christ. Okay? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. You think about from all eternity, the three persons of the Trinity have been having an interior dialogue, if you want to put it that way. They've been communicating to each other in love. Well, what is that like? I don't know. Right? Could we even get close to that? No. But if the Spirit of God lives in you, then through the spirit that lives in you, you are being brought up into that eternal dialogue between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that is not expressible in human words, right? That's what he's saying here. You have been brought into the Trinity. In some ways, this drawing is inadequate. In other ways, I mean, all analogies fall short, but Adam and Eve, like this is correct, right? There's the Trinity and the Adam and Eve. In some ways, in many ways, it would be more correct to draw us in the triangle because we live, the Spirit of God, with a capital S, lives in us. And we've been grafted on to the body of Christ. Well, who is Christ? Christ is God. He is in the Trinity. I mean, uh, this is a little crude, but, <laughs> well, it's always going to be a little crude, right? But, like, if you want to think about it this way, there's the Trinity, right? Jesus, when he takes on a human nature, is fully God, fully man, right? He's, he's in the Trinity. Well, where are we? 
right there. Adam and Eve didn't enjoy that. They were in harmony with God, but they weren't in the Holy Trinity like you and I are. We are through two ways, at least, right? Through being grafted onto the body of Christ and through his spirit, which dwells within us, okay? Our, our access to the Trinity, another way to, beautiful way to put it, our way into the Trinity is the humanity of Christ, right? That's why we always go back to that, okay? So the spirit, the spirit that lives within us knows what we need and knows how to pray, knows how to enter into this eternal relationship of divinity. And so intercedes with us with sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now we do need to pray. Okay, Jesus does tell us to ask for things, right? But we shouldn't pray with a kind of angst and anxiety of like, you know, I need to push the right buttons for God to listen, right? Why? Because the spirit that lives within you is already interceding for you. Also, too, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, right? Um, it is only with, through the spirit that we can even say, Abba, Father, right? It is the spirit himself bearing witness. The only way that we can say, Abba, Father, or Jesus Christ is Lord, is the spirit who prompts us to do such things, right? The Spirit is already working within those who believe. Right? That's the point. 28, we know that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't necessarily mean, that doesn't mean that God wills evil for you, okay? But it means that God can bring good even out of the worst evils, even out of the worst kinds of suffering. So we have no reason to despair. Um, Paul and us should know this from the witness of Scripture. Like, how about Joseph in Genesis? All these bad things happen to him. He gets sold into slavery by his brothers, but God orchestrates it for good. Right? That's what Joseph says. Or how about the greatest example? The cross itself. Right? The greatest evil becomes the greatest good. God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. A lot of people don't know this, but like as Catholics, we actually do believe in predestination in the sense that God predestined us. He foresaw from the beginning of creation that we were meant to live with him in Jesus Christ. Now, what we don't believe in is double predestination, which is not only did God foresee that, but you also have no say in the matter. <laughs> okay. You have no free will. That's called double predestination. If you're a Calvinist, that's where he went. Okay, That's not good. But predestined in terms of God planned from the beginning of creation for you to be with him in the Trinity through his son. Okay, that In that sense of predestination, and that's what Paul says, we were predestined right, to be conformed in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn is an is, is a important title, right, especially in the ancient world. Jesus is our exemplar who gives us the perfect example of sonship. He's gone before us as our elder brother in, the, in, in faith, so to speak. And then he's the primary heir. In the ancient world, the first one was the primary heir, right? Um, and he and us along with him. Why? Because we're grafted onto his body. So we're along for the ride too. Uh, or if you want to think about it as like he's the firstborn, he's the head, and we're the body. We talked about the analogy of birth last week. Where he goes, we follow, right? Okay. Uh, and then, uh, and those whom he presently also, yeah, we read that, right? No. And those, th verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I'm going to finish chapter eight just because this is a good, this will be a good stopping point for two weeks. Okay. Sorry. I will go a little bit over time. Sorry. Uh, verse 31. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? So if God's spirit is working in us through all things good and bad, right, then for our ultimate benefit, then what do we have to fear? Nothing. If suffering cannot keep us from God, then what, what can, right? Like, you know, man, Everything, like everything in my life is falling apart. I'm suffering a lot. Yeah, but that's 
God is, that doesn't mean you're apart from the love of God. God is actually working towards your good, right? Again, not that he wills evil on you, but he can orchestrate your life for your good, okay? Um, also, there's an allusion here to the story, not, not coincidentally, to the story of Abraham, right? God tells Isaac to spare his own only beloved son. But God, what he does not ask Abraham to do, God does. He does not spare his only begotten son. So God, God does what he, he doesn't spare his son, Jesus, right? So if God is willing to give his only son for our benefit, what else is he there to, what else will he not give, right? What more is there to give than the divine, the father giving his, the, the father from all eternity giving the divine son for us, right? He won't, there's nothing, you know, what will he also not give, right? Verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. If you want to give a person to this, how about Satan? Satan means accuser. Okay, what is Satan going to say? You know, well, God, I've got this other thing again. No, like God has, God has justified us. Game over, right? <laughs> Satan doesn't have a, a leg to stand on anymore. Okay, or anyone for that matter. It is, it is Christ Jesus who died, yet who was raised from the dead. Who is at the right hand of God who, who intercedes for us? I think I read that wrong. It, is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God who indeed intercedes for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? All these different kinds of suffering. Okay. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, this is kind of an interesting little verse here that Paul throws in here. Okay, what is this from? This is, uh, he's quoting here Psalm 44, 22. And the psalmist is puzzled, and this is a common theme in the Psalms and in the Old Testament. Why is it that the righteous suffer? And isn't that kind of a perennial question, right? Why is it that bad things happen to good people, right? You want to look at the book of Job, okay? But the psalmist is grappling with this. You know, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're like sheep led to slaughter. God, if you love us, why are you letting us happen, right? That's what the psalmist is saying, okay? Why does Paul throw this in there? Because our suffering in Christ is now the very means by which we conquer. If in the Old Testament or in our kind of default position is like we think like suffering means failure, God has now turned suffering, which seems to indicate failure or, or disfavor, now into triumph and election. Why? Through the suffering of Christ on the cross. So suffering is not a sign of God's curse, as the psalmist is kind of tempted to think, right? And in the Old Testament, they're tempted to think, but a sign of God's election in Christ. Why? Because now our sufferings are brought into his and now become the means of victory. Uh, the very thing that afflicts us, suffering, death, that hangs over our head, and by the way, causes a lot of us to sin, right? Why do I, some sins, why do I sin? Because I don't want to suffer, right? Well, now our embracing of suffering becomes the cause for our victory when we take up our crosses and follow Christ. If you want to think about it this way, God has rigged the game, okay? I mean, imagine if like you were playing football and every time the opposing team scored a touchdown, you get points on the board. The other team would go, well, we can't win, you know. Or if, or if like you had, you know, the coin, right, you know, heads I win, tails you lose, right? You know? It's like that's what God did, right? It's like heads I win, tails devil loses, right? <laughs> you cause them to good things to happen, like I'll, I'll get them there, right? You cause suffering for them, I'm still going to get them there, right? And, you know, it's like, well, I guess I can't win, right? You know, the, the game is rigged in our favor. <laughs> Suffering is not a sign, right? Because that's the whole question of this section, right? Does God, how can God love us and allow us to suffer like this, right? Because God has turned suffering into a means of our victory because of what he did in the cross, right? So what's his answer? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us through Jesus. And this is beautiful, right? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I mean, it's a very beautiful way to end. Again, and it's a little choppy when we're kind of going through it, but like if you read this whole section, it's just like really just how immense and wonderful God's love is for us and how the depths that he goes to to rig the game in our favor, right? Now, a couple of final notes, okay? Paul's not saying, okay, and this is where you will get some errors of reading this chapter. Chapter 8 is wonderful, but if you read it out of context, as some do, they'll make it sound like Paul's saying our salvation is absolutely assured. Once saved, always saved, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God, okay? Um, but, okay, if you read Paul in context, and even if you read him what he's saying here, there is a threat to our salvation. It's our free will, right? We can still reject God's grace, okay? We can re re reject his free gift of salvation. All those things that Paul mentioned, height, depth, powers, principalities, angels, those are all, all the cosmic forces, all the things outside of our control. They cannot separate us from the love of God, okay? But I can still say no, okay? God will not save me against my will is another way to say it, okay? Um, so Romans 8 is a wonderful exposition on God's love. It's a great chapter of the Bible, but it can't be read in isolation and then be led to a once saved, always saved. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Once I've accepted him, then, you know, it's like I said, that's even against Romans, I would argue, but you don't want to read that in isolation. Um, the main point of this final section, right, our sufferings are not a reason for us to doubt God's love for us. Isn't that the temptation always, though, right? I'm going through a hard time. I mean, shoot, I'm having a bad day. God must not love me, right? And I, I mean, I don't say that to mock anybody, right? But like, but even on a bad day, right, much less something like a horrible disease or cancer, or, you know, some kind of tragedy, right? God, where are you, right? That's what we can struggle with, right? Paul's trying to get that notion out of our mind, right? That like, no, God is working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So Paul is talking about how suffering cannot separate us from God love, God's love. It can't, sorry. Suffering cannot separate us from God's love. He's not talking saying sin cannot separate us from God's love, okay? See the difference? Suffering is the result of sin, right? Our fallen world. And it cannot separate us from God's love. But yes, sin, meaning my choice to go against God, yes, that can, my free will. Okay, It's not talking about that. It's obvious from other chapters and from Paul's other writings that sin can absolutely separate us from God's love. Nevertheless, I don't, want, I don't say that to take away from this chapter at all. Okay, It's a beautiful chapter of the Bible. I encourage you to go read through it like just the whole way. Okay, Because um, it's something that I think we can in Romans 8 is something that we can and should come back to often for encouragement. I mean, like I said, if you're having a bad day or struggling in your faith, just read that first verse, right? There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right.